Now, we've been doing continuous time population models, but discrete time models are no less important. Let's consider what happens in some discrete time versions of, let's say, some of the models that we've been looking at in continuous time. For example, if we go back to the competitive model that we were just working with, recall what the equations for those were in continuous time, we can build a discrete time model by swapping out for the differentiation operator, capital D, the finite difference operator, delta. And what happens is when we write that out, we get the model xn plus 1 equals xn plus xn times quantity 1 minus xn minus alpha times yn. And yn plus 1 equals yn plus r times yn times quantity 1 minus yn minus beta times xn. That is a discrete time version of this competitive model. And now we can analyze that model just as we did in continuous time. And to make a long story short, when it comes to equilibria, yep, same as before. What about the derivative? The derivative of the right-hand side is going to be the same as it was before, but adding an identity matrix to it. So the derivative is, by columns, 2 minus 2x minus alpha times y, minus r times beta times y, minus alpha times x, and 1 plus r minus 2ry minus r beta x. And you will notice that the only difference between this and what we saw in continuous time is along the diagonal terms, we've added 1 to each of those entries. And the good news is that most of the analysis and the outcomes in this discrete time system are going to be the same. You're just going to be hopping along the continuous flow line solutions that we had before. You still get cooperative solutions, competitive exclusion, all that good kind of stuff. For example, if we consider the equilibrium at 1, 0, if we substitute into that derivative x equals 1, y equals 0, we get the matrix 0, negative alpha, 0, and 1 plus r times quantity 1 minus beta. Interpreting this, what we see is that along the x-axis, everything is super stable. We have a 0 eigenvalue with an eigenvector of 1, 0. What happens with the other eigenvalue depends on beta. Just like before, if beta is less than 1, then that second eigenvalue is definitely bigger than 1, and that means that we have a saddle point. But when beta is bigger than 1, then, just like before, we get a sink. Oh, wait a minute. I think we have to be a little bit careful here, because if beta gets to be too large, then this eigenvalue, which is less than 1, can wind up going less than negative 1 and go from being stable to unstable. We need beta to be less than 1 plus 2 times r. Ooh, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. You need to be careful and remember the details of the stability criterion in discrete time. Now, of course, that's not the real difficulty. The real difficult part of this discrete time model is analyzing the equilibrium at 1 minus alpha over 1 minus alpha beta and 1 minus beta over 1 minus alpha beta because there's no trace determinate stuff going on here. You're going to need to compute eigenvalues, and that is going to be painful. We're not going to touch that other than to say when you're working in a discrete time system, you really have to do the work and compute the eigenvalues.